You're going to open your Bibles up to the third epistle of John. This is Foundational Connections, class number five. Third John, the third epistle of John. There's only one chapter, so we're going to look at verse two. Beloved, I pray or I desire that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, I like the King James. It says, Beloved, I wish or I desire above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. You know, it's interesting. God makes it very clear that he, above all other things, wants us to what two things? Prosper and be in health. Now, why? Be about our Father's business. Exactly right. Now, this means immediately that God doesn't want us sick or diseased. You know, it's interesting to me how that in my life and ministry of around 40 years, that people want to argue with me about this point. So interesting. We'll get to that. But you know, if you really want to see the will of God, you have to look at the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus tells us the will of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus was the exact representation of God. The perfect representation of God. And in Matthew 9, verse 35, this is what Jesus did when he was on the earth. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Never one time, not one example at all, not once, did Jesus say to someone that he could not heal them because God was teaching them something through that sickness and disease. That is a man-made idea. Not one time did Jesus say that. And then also notice, according to 3 John 2, God wants us to prosper. The word prosper means to thrive and flourish. That's the Greek, what the Greek word means. This means financially, materially, and every other way. Now, there was an abuse of the so-called prosperity message, and I know it was. I talked about it. I believe in prosperity because the Bible teaches prosperity, but it's Bible prosperity. Amen. Amen. Some people took it to extremes that are not scriptural. Yet we don't want to, as the old saying goes, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, there's been extremes. We don't throw the message of salvation away because some people teach the wrong thing about salvation. Some people say, you know, no matter, you know, once you accept Jesus, no matter what you do, you're guaranteed heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, there's a, there's a strong guarantee there, but it doesn't, it's not carte blanche. Okay? But we don't throw that out. We don't throw out a lot of other truths just because somebody uh, abuses it. Well, the truth of prosperity is true. God wants us to prosper so that we can be a blessing to the kingdom of God and be able to help people. Amen. Now, 
in this message, the, the abuse was that people were just wanting to prosper just to consume it upon their own desires. They just wanted to be blessed so that they could just do whatever they wanted to do and have whatever they could want. That's not right. Turn to James 4. That's not the right motivation. James 4, verse 2, it says, You lust, the word lust means strongly desire. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So if it's just about what we want, that's wrong. But yet on the other side, turn to Psalm 35. On the other side, the truth of God's word declares this. Psalm 35, verse 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them say continue, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. When you thrive and flourish as a servant of Almighty God, God has pleasure in that. Just like you, any of you parents here, how many of you are parents? Okay. Do you have pleasure when your kids are thriving and flourishing? Financially, physically, and every other way? Amen. We want to see them succeed. Well, God's a better parent than we are. Amen. Just as with anything else in the Word of God, 3 John 2 tells us conditions we must meet in order to prosper and be in hell. So this, you know, it's not just... This is the will of God, so this is going to happen. Is There's some things that we have to do. Go back to 3 John 2 now. And let's take a look at this. The third epistle of John, verse 2. It says, Beloved, I wish or I desire that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So there's the condition. Just, or as King James says, even as our soul prospers. Amen. To the degree our soul, and the soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Remember, our spirit is the part of us that gets born again. Our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. So we have to prosper our soul because our spirit is instantly changed when? When we get born again. But our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, the mind has to be renewed. Our will has to be submitted to the will of God. And our emotions have to come under the control of the Holy Spirit. To the degree our soul, our mind and will and emotions prosper, that is the degree God is able to prosper us and help us be in health. How do we prosper our soul? Well, we use what I taught a while ago. We call it the 3M process. Memorization. The word, the word memorization gets the word where? In your head. In your mind. That's right. But is that real prosperity? No, it's a start. You have a lot of people with a lot of head knowledge, but they don't ever get it beyond that into the revelation knowledge, which happens when we meditate. That's the, third, the second M. The second M is meditation. I'm not talking about Eastern meditation. I'm talking about just taking the word of God that you've memorized and saying it out loud to yourself over and over and over. You chew on it like a cow chews on the cud. It's literally what the Hebrew means. And so we do that and we get the word of God goes from our head to our heart. The word of God becomes a personal word to you. When the word of God becomes a personal word to you, nobody can take it away from you. And when that happens, it leads to the third M, which is metamorphosis or transformation. 
Romans 12, 2 says, you know, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform in the Greek is metamorpho, from, we get, from which we get our English word metamorphosis. Amen. And so you get transformed, which means to go from one form, caterpillar, to another completely different form, butterfly. From a piece of coal, which is put under extreme pressure, it becomes a diamond, completely different form. Okay? So we go from earth-minded, which is one form, to heavenly-minded, which is a completely different form. Amen. So that's prospering the soul. To the degree that we do that, that's where we can prosper and be in health. We meet the conditions, prosperity and health will follow. Now that's not the only conditions, but that's what we're going to talk about right now. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we also need to turn to Galatians chapter 3. We need to realize that when Jesus died for us, he did not just die for our sins. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, if you read that just very flippantly or just kind of looking at that at the service, you go, oh, yeah, I'm going to redeem from the curse of the law. But if you don't go back to Deuteronomy 28 and see exactly what the curse of the law is, you won't understand what we've been redeemed from. Now, remember, under blood covenant, which we have the old blood covenant, which is the Old Testament. We have the new blood covenant, which is the New Testament. Okay? Under those, you see, blood covenant, when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you enter into a completely binding blood covenant. I think we've done people a disservice when we just presented salvation as this free gift and there's no strings attached. Oh, folks, there's lots of strings attached. You're entering into an unbreakable blood covenant with Almighty God. And under blood covenants, there was blessings for keeping the covenant. There was curses for breaking the covenant. Let's just turn to Deuteronomy 28. We're not going to read the whole thing, but just kind of get a picture of what we're talking about here. God basically tells the people of Israel, okay, in verse 1, it says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And he goes on to say, Blessed you know, all, the, all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed, blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. In other words, wherever you go, you're blessed. The word blessed means empowered to prosper. So in other words, God says, I'm going to empower you to thrive and flourish if you keep my covenant. If you break my covenant. Go to verse 15 now. Verses 1 through 14 talk about the blessings of keeping the covenant. Verse 15 through verse 68 talk about the curses. As, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments and statutes which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now thank God we do not live under the Old Testament law. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. That doesn't mean the curse has disappeared, but we've been bought back from the curse. So we don't have to suffer the full penalties of that curse because of what Jesus did. That's what the word redeem means. It means bought back from. He paid a terrible, awful price to buy us back from the curse of the law. Amen. Now the curse of the law, basically, it, now you can, you can, if you, I did a study on, I think a Wednesday night I preached on this, and I talked about there's more to it than just these three things, but basically you can break it down to these three major things, and then you can go a little further than that, but 
for, our, for time's sake, we're going to talk about the three things. Sickness and disease is included in that. That it talks about that sickness and disease would come upon them for breaking the, the covenant. Poverty and lack would come upon them. Amen. And part of that would be that they would go into captivity and have everything taken from them. And of course, Israel did that more than once. Sad to say. They didn't learn their lesson. Amen. And then finally, spiritual death, which is separation from God and all that goes with that. Okay? So if we are covenant keepers, God wants to bless us and keep us healthy. Now, why would God want that for us above all things? Number one, because Satan's attacks concentrate mostly on those two areas. Why? Because if you're sick, you're just going to focus in on yourself. You're going to try to be getting well. Amen. You know, if, you, if you're dealing with sickness and disease, you're primarily focusing in on yourself. Now, there's some people that can think a little bit beyond themselves, but mostly they think about themselves. What about if you're just barely getting by? See, that's why. You know, one of the reasons why Satan hates the United States of America is because so many of us are not just barely getting by. See, most countries of the world, look down, you know, in Mexico, you have the very rich and you have the very poor and there's hardly anybody in between. And the very poor are scrambling so hard just to make ends meet that they don't have much time for anything else. The very rich are so rich that they're just selfish usually consuming upon their own desires. But in the United States, the devil hates it because we have what we call the middle class. Amen. And the middle class are a group of people where we have enough, where we can be comfortable, we can focus in on helping others and do other things. Amen. Now, not all the middle class do that, but at least we have the ability to do that. All right? So, the other reason why these attacks are so effective is because they involve the five senses so very much. I mean, sickness really, I mean, if you're dealing with pain, that's, <laughs> it's hard to think beyond pain. If you're dealing with symptoms, it's hard to think beyond the symptoms because they, 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 they really grab a hold of you. If, if you're, if you're you know, getting threatened with homelessness because you're so behind in your mortgage or whatever that you, you, know, you might lose your place to live, I mean, that's, that's tough. It is not a blessing to be barely getting by. Satan can hinder us most by impoverishing us and keeping us sick. The two kinds of people who don't have much time to help and bless others and for the kingdom of God, number one, poor people, and number two, sick people. Think about in the Bible, the man at the pool of Bethesda. Remember, he was there 25 years trying to get into the water when the angel would come down and stir up the water. 25 years he laid there and he had nobody to help him into the pool. He'd been 38 years in that condition. So who was he thinking about? Was he going around helping a lot of people? No, he was thinking about getting into that pool and getting healed. He was just existing. Somebody had to, you know, somehow he was getting some food. I don't know if there was some ministries that, that, that helped poor people that hung around the pool or whatever, but uh, he somehow survived, but th that's all he was thinking about was getting into that pool. And even when Jesus came up to him, he said, I have no man that can help me into the pool. When the water's troubled, somebody always gets down there before me. Me, 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 me. But of course, when you're crippled, that's, it's hard to think about other things because you're barely getting by. Amen. So God wants, he's redeemed us from the curse of the law 
to bless us so we can be a blessing. Not bless us so we can just do our own thing, go to the lake every weekend, just, you know, have great blessings and all these toys and stuff and just do our own thing. He blesses us so we can be a blessing. Now, turn to Romans, the 10th chapter. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans, the 10th chapter. Familiar passages of Scripture. Verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God is raised him from the dead, what will happen? You'll be saved. The word saved in the Greek is sozo. And if you look that word up, it doesn't just mean new birth, getting saved from our sin, but it means also healing, wholeness, safety, soundness, deliverance, preservation. It has all those meanings. So with the heart one believes into right standing and with the mouth confession is made unto healing. With the mouth confession is made unto wholeness. With the mouth confession is made unto deliverance. With the mouth confession is made unto soundness. With the mouth confession is made unto safety. And obviously to the new birth as well. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. Verse 9. But as it is written, this is quoted out of Isaiah 64. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared. God has prepared for those who love him. Now, some people have taken this verse and say, oh, yeah, I see, we can't know what God wants. No, that's not what it's saying. Look at verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. The Holy Spirit's given to show us all these things. Show us what's available to us. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So much of the time, our time is spent on the very shallow things of God and we never get to the deeper things of God that God wants us to get to. Amen. All right? So it is by a lack of knowledge. Satan is able to steal, kill, and destroy people through poverty and lack, sickness and disease and circumstances. Turn to Hosea 4. Hosea, the fourth chapter. I'm getting there. Look at verse 6. My people are destroyed. Why? For a lack of knowledge. What you don't know can hurt you. Amen. Satan uses this Lack of understanding that we've been redeemed from sickness and disease. We've been redeemed from poverty and lack. We've been redeemed from the attacks of the enemy. He's redeemed us so we can walk in victory over these attacks. But a lot of times, people aren't even taught that this stuff's caused by the devil. For by and large, people just kind of treat the devil. They don't, they're just like they don't even want to talk about it. You, you, you know, they don't even want to use the term the devil. They call him the enemy. <laughs> they don't even want to refer to the devil. It's like, mm, you know, we don't want, to, don't want to stir the waters. You know, so it's like they're afraid to talk about it. Or they ignore his works completely. Amen. Now we need to understand here in Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, it says, But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a what? Better covenant, which is established on what? 
better promises. So we have a better covenant than the old covenant established upon better promises than the old covenant. Now, even though we have a better covenant, better promises, yet there are some old covenant examples of very great prosperity under the old covenant. Financial, material prosperity. I mean, look at Abraham. He was a covenant-keeping man, and he prospered greatly. Isaac, remember, he was a covenant-keeping man, and the Bible says, in famine, he sowed according to the word of the Lord, and reaped what? A hundredfold. In famine. So in other words, there's a drought and whatever, but God said, plant. That's not the time to plant as normally, but God so blessed it, despite there was lack of water, that he reaped a hundredfold. That's the blessing of God. Look at Joseph. You know, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers because they were jealous of it. But he rose up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife tried to commit adultery, get him to commit adultery with her. He refused. She falsely accused him. He got thrown into prison. But he kept a right attitude. He kept a right attitude. And he rose up and soon he was running the prison underneath the prison keeper. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh gets his dream. And he brings in all of his wise men and fortune tellers and soothsayers and none of them could interpret the dream. Well, remember the butler and the baker had been thrown into prison and, and talked with Joseph and they both had dreams and Joseph interpreted their dreams. Well, the, the baker got his head cut off and the butler got promoted back to his original position. Well, the butler goes, oh, my Lord, it's my mistake. You know, I told this man that's in prison, he interpreted my dream. I had a dream, nobody could tell me what it meant, but he interpreted my dream, and uh, maybe you could get him to come up. And I was supposed to, you know, remember him when I got restored to my position. I'd forgotten him. So Pharaoh said, bring him up. And Joseph, by the Holy Ghost, told him exactly what that dream was, and he went from prison to the dungeon to second in command. That's prospering. That's flourishing. Amen. And so then he oversaw the seven years of plenty that they had seen so that they were ready for the seven years of famine that were following according to the dream. Okay? So Joseph prospered greatly. Look at King David, prospered greatly. Solomon, <laughs> Solomon, he had so much gold piled up. They had to pile it up. He had so much gold, they had to pile it up. And they had so much silver, they didn't have any room for the silver, they had to pile it up outside the gates. Because he was so wise in how he dealt with things. Look at Job. People say, oh yeah, poor old Job. What happened to Job lasted only about nine months. He was the richest man in the East before that. And then after he got things straightened out, got his thinking straightened out, what happened to him? He got twice as much as he had before and he was already the richest man in the East. God blessed him. He got into fear. Romans, or I mean Job 3.25 says, he, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. Fear will open the door the way faith will open the door to God. Fear opens the door to the devil, and that's what did. He was so in fear about his children and, and things that he lost it all. Once he got back in faith, God gave him twice as much as he had before. Look at Jesus. Jesus functioned under the old covenant. And when Judas who was treasurer, went out to betray Jesus, what did they think he was going to go, go do? Go give to the poor. Well, I'll tell you, you don't give to the poor unless you got enough and more than enough. And it must have been something they did regularly and often. Jesus was blessed, had more than enough. How much more 
Should we prosper and be in health under this new and better covenant? Old Testament people are blessed. How much more should we? You know, really, God's design is that we make the Jews jealous. The church is designed to make the Jews jealous. We haven't done that yet. Amen. I'm not talking about being selfish and, and a bunch of self-centered, you know, centered, uh, selfish idiots. I'm talking about being so blessed that we have more than enough that, that, that our charity becomes known. Turn to 2 Corinthians 8. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, the word rich simply means abundantly supplied, yet for your sakes he became poor. I mean, he was stripped of everything, including his clothes, and hung on a cross, that you, through his poverty, might become rich, abundantly supplied. God wants us abundantly supplied. Jesus, as our substitute, suffered all we deserved because of our sin. He suffered poverty and lack. We deserved that. All was stripped from him, taken from him. As I said, even his clothes. Jesus on the cross was made sick with our sicknesses and diseases. Turn to Isaiah 53. Now, if you just read Isaiah 53 is by Bible scholars all agree that this is talking about Jesus. Of course, it couldn't be anybody else. But um, in verse 2, it says, For he, talking about Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's talking about after he's been beaten by the Roman soldiers. Amen. Verse 3 now. He is despised and rejected by men. All of his disciples forsook him except for John. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We know that sorrows and grief, according to the next verse, if you probably, if you look at um, the margin of your Bible, it probably has the most common way grief is translated as sickness. The most common way sorrow is translated is pain. A man of pain and acquainted with sicknesses. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. I mean, Jesus on the cross took all of our sin. Can you imagine carrying that weight, the sin of the whole world? Took the curse, sickness, disease, all that goes with that. I mean, he became a curse for us. He literally was made sick with our sicknesses. Turn to Matthew 8. See how Matthew says it. Jesus is healing in his ministry on the earth. And this is how Matthew describes it in verse 16. When, when evening had come, they brought to him Jesus many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So Jesus healing the sick was a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 4. Amen. Glory to God. So Jesus took the full penalty of the curse that we deserve so we can have the full blessing we don't deserve, which is called what? Grace. Thank you. Now, as I said, some people, it's like they fight for the right to be sick. <laughs> it, just, it just amazes me that some people want to fight for the right to be sick. And I'm just going, why? Anybody here really blessed when you're sick? I mean, just like, oh yeah, this, this, this is the greatest thing. Can you imagine? Daryl, are you just really having a lot of fun these days? <laughs> Okay. Why? Because sickness isn't a blessing. Amen. 
But that's what we'll get back to that. First of all, some people want to argue against prosperity. You know, they, they say, well, we should be content. The Bible says we should be content. Turn to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. You're right. The Bible does say that, but we've got to rightly divide the word of truth. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Now see, there, gets, there needs to be a point in our life when we decide this is how much is enough. Amen. We decide this is, how mu- this is how much we need. This is enough for us. And then everything above and beyond that. Do you remember I've talked about Joe Letourneau? Joe Letourneau was a man, I think he was in, I believe he's originally from Kansas. And some missionaries came in and he was so grieved. He, he obviously had a giving gift. And so he was so grieved because he didn't have but just a few dollars to give to this missionary. And he began to cry out to God. God, I want to be a greater blessing. But I don't know how to do it. And God gave him a dream. And in this dream, he had pictures of all this earth-moving equipment. Bulldozers. Turnipoles. Backhoes. You know, all the different kinds of earth-moving equipment that had never been seen before. And so he took those pictures from the dream and had them drawn up and he started a company. What was that company called? Caterpillar. And he put millions of dollars. This is years ago now. He put millions of dollars. He got to the place. It was his goal where he, instead of just bringing the tithe, which is a tenth, he wanted to get to the place where he could give, you know, bring the tithe and then another 80% live on the ten. And as he got to that place. He lived on the 10, and the 10 was more than he had when he started out. But see, that's the godly way. He prospered for the right reasons. Amen. Some people say, well, you know, I really don't want much. That's a very selfish attitude. I just want enough for me and mine. That's a very selfish attitude. I want to prosper so I can be a blessing to the kingdom of God. How many of you see some needs out there when you're you're out in amongst the world? How many of you like to be able to help with those needs? Yes. God wants to bless us so we can be a blessing. But if you're just barely getting by, you can't help. So contentment is deciding how much is enough for you. And then everything above and beyond that you begin to give as God directs. And it just, you know, and the more seed you sow, the more you get back and it just becomes this multiplying thing. Amen. Now, it's true that, you know, just as water that flows through a pipe, the the pipe gets wet. Well, when blessings flow flow through you, you're going to get wet with those blessings. Glory to God. But see, it's, it's learning to have the right attitude. Okay? You know, it's, it's interesting that these same people that say, well, we should be content, they're always striving for more. I'm going, well, if you're, if you're content, why don't you just get a tent and live in a tent and, and, and just get, barely get by then, just be content. But see, they don't want that. They're always looking for, you know, a raise. They're always looking for a better job, you know, songs, better investments, whatever. I mean, it's really a hypocritical type of way. But what they're really saying is that they want to claim credit. It's me and my power that's gotten me this wealth, and God has nothing to do with it. Well, God gives you breath. God gives you strength. God gives you life. He owns it all. You're just a steward of what he has blessed you with. Amen. Second argument people say against prosperity, well, money is evil. Is that what the Bible says? No. Money's just a tool. We're right here in 1 Timothy 6. Look at verse 10. 
For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money. Just wanting money for money's sake for your own self. That's the root of all kinds of evil. You can have money, but not love it. You can have no money and love it terribly. There's some poor people that love money more than some rich people I know. They just don't have any of it. It's not money itself. Money's just a tool. Number three, the third argument against prosperity. Well, God teaches us through poverty and sickness. Now, we can learn despite experiencing poverty and sickness or anything else that comes. But God doesn't use evil to tempt, test, or try us. Look at James chapter 1. I mean, that's like a parent taking their child to a stove and saying, okay, don't touch the stove because it's hot, and then grabbing their hand and putting it on the hot stove and burning them. That's abuse. A lot of people portray God like a child abuser. It really makes me kind of angry because I, I love my Heavenly Father so much, I don't want him portrayed that way. Oh, God's doing this to teach me something. Why then are you going to the hospital? If he's trying to teach you something, why are you trying to get well and get out of the will of God? I mean, people are so hypocritical. They take medicine. Oh, God's trying to teach me something. Well, if he's trying to teach you something, you better learn it then and quit taking that medicine. Just learn it. You know, if, if God uses sickness and disease to teach people something, we better, you know, better get around all those health workers like Jenny and, and Brenda and stuff. Man, they're all the, 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 of the devil then because they're trying to keep people from learning stuff. That's so stupid. In spite of these things, God will teach you, but he doesn't use those things to teach you. Look at James 1 verse 13. Let no one say. How many people say? No one. Yet we have a whole bunch of Christians saying that this is what God does when he is tempted, tested, or tried. That's what the word means. If you look up that Greek word, it means tempted, tested, or tried. I'm tempted, tested, or tried by God. For God cannot be tempted, tested, or tried by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, in other words, with evil. God doesn't use evil to tempt, test, or try you. God will test your obedience, just like he did with Abraham in Genesis 22. But God doesn't use evil. He doesn't need the devil to, to do his object lessons. Now, you can take yourself over into the devil's territory and he'll beat the snot out of you for a while and you might come running back to God. That doesn't mean God's the one doing that stuff. You brought it on yourself. But God's there lovingly ready to help you, to heal you, to deliver you, to receive you with open arms, forgive you, wash away all your sin, take away all the guilt and the shame and all that junk. Amen. Because he's good. He's a good father. Amen. All right, let's talk about sickness and disease, some of the arguments that I've heard. And when you get right down to it, they're ridiculous. Number one, God brought sickness to Uncle Ed, so when he died, several relatives got saved at his funeral. That's just dumb. Death is, a, is an enemy, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15. It's the last enemy that's going to be put underfoot. Now, when Uncle Ed died, God can work good out of something that, the, that Satan wrought. And the preaching of the gospel got those people saved, not the death of Uncle Ed. Amen. God is not the author of sickness and disease. Turn to Acts 10. Acts the 10th chapter. Verse 38. 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were what? Oppressed by the devil. Are you saying that if I'm sick, I'm of the devil? No, I said you're oppressed by him. Oppression means pressure from the outside, putting some sort of pressure on you. Now, well, Brenda, I'm going to give you an example of oppression. Can you feel this? I certainly can. You certainly can. <laughs> That's oppression. I was oppressing down on her. How many of you just feel just hunky-dory and wonderful and great when sickness and disease come? No. It presses down on you. It strips energy and life from you because it's an attack of the enemy. Attack of the devil. Sickness is satanic oppression of the body. Now God can always work good through a bad situation, but that doesn't mean he caused it. Amen. God gets glory when? When you get healed, when you, when you overcome, right. Argument number two. Aunt Myrtle was such a good person, how come she didn't get healed? Well, I'm not arguing that Aunt Myrtle wasn't a good person. A lot of good person die from sickness and disease. Amen. And a lot of it's because they simply did not know that God was their healer or how to receive their healing by faith. Oh, but this, this, she was such a good person. I, I believe she was believing. Well, you don't know what was in her heart. You know, it's, it's like this. You, know, you ever tried to plug something in in the dark? Okay, you know there's an outlet on the wall there and you're there and you... And you're kind of fumbling around. Sometimes you get one of the prongs in and you go, oh, okay. And then you try to get the other one in. And I think that's why, you know, if you don't have clear knowledge of how to receive healing, it's, you're kind of hit and miss. You're kind of trying to plug in. But then there's, if you don't plug in, there's no flow. And if, you don't, if there's no flow, you can't turn whatever it is, power, whatever it is, on, Right? Because you need power flowing to it. Well, the power, Jesus bought and paid for the power to flow. But if you don't plug in, that's, how, that's what faith is. Faith is plugging in. So the power can flow. Doesn't mean, you know, my mom was as good a person as you'll ever meet. And you'll meet her someday in heaven. But because she didn't plug in to the power of God, she died from cancer. Does that make her any less good? No. It just means the devil stole her at 60 years old and I lost a bunch of years enjoying my mom. You see, that, that, that's no knock on my mom. It's no knock on Aunt Myrtle or whoever. But that's, that's one of the, you know, people want to use their experience to supersede the word of God and you can't do that. Your experience does not trump the word of God. That's what, how many of you know about progressive Christianity? Progressive Christianity is all about experience. They say their experience is higher than the word of God. They throw away the virgin birth, the resurrection, all this stuff. <laughs> it's just absolute farce. It's all about their experiences. Oh, I experienced this and I experienced that. Well, your experiences can be as devilish as can be and it doesn't mean it's of God. We need to judge our experiences in the light of God's word. Amen. Number three, people say sometimes, they'll say, well, sickness is sometimes God's will. How can a work of the devil be God's will? Never once did Jesus ever indicate such a ridiculous idea. He never said, oh, I can't heal you because it's God's will that you be sick. I'm sorry. Just too bad. So sad. See you later. No. If such a ridiculous idea were true, then every healthcare worker should be the enemy of God, which is just not the case. 
God is not glorified by sickness or disease, but when people are healed. Let's close with this verse, 1 John 3. First John, the third chapter, look at verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works, plural, of the devil. We learn from Acts 10.38 that sickness is oppression of the devil. And Jesus came to preach, teach, and heal, destroying that work of the devil. Amen. And you know what? Obviously, he must have gave a lot to the poor because he saw poverty as a work of the devil. Amen. So, what's, what's the conclusion? Above all things, God wants us to prosper and to be in health even as our soul prospers. He's a good father. He loves us. He cares about our health. He cares about our well-being. Amen? Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. See, and that's why I hate sickness and disease so much. I don't hate the person, but I hate whatever condition is keeping them from being able to have a full life. Pain. You know, I, I love... Um, there's a chiropractor in Elk River, and on their door they have, pain is not a lifestyle. I love it. Because it's not meant to be. Sickness and disease is not meant to be a lifestyle. We are meant to walk in health, healing, and wholeness. All the days of our life. And to prosper, to thrive and flourish, Financially, materially, and every other way as our soul prospers. Amen? Glory to God. Let's just lift our hands for a minute, see if there's anything else he wants to do in this realm. Father, we just thank you so much for being so good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know... I just keep feeling the Holy Spirit prompt to me if they're, you know, I just preached on the fact that, that sickness and disease is not the will of God and that healing and health have been provided for you through what Jesus did. And I just, if you have sickness, disease, or pain in your body and you want to get healed right now, come up here now. And I'm going to lay hands on you. The Bible says in Mark 16, verse 17, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Thank you, Lord. 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 All the effects of COVID-19 are cursed and removed from this body in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That's just the power of God. Don't be afraid of that. That's just the power of God coming in. That's because you're believing. That's because you're believing. Power of God's flowing into you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We curse every vestige of the effects of COVID in this body. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my. Yeah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Well, that's, what, that's what's happening. It's just... Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. Is that what you said? It feels itchy? Yeah. Well, how many of you know when, what, what, what's the, your temptation? If you have a cut and it begins to scab up, what, what, what's the temptation? Scratch it. To scratch it. Why? Because it's healing. Yes. Glory to God. You ready for your healing? Yes. In the name of Jesus. 
I curse this. Oh, there it is. There's the power of God right there. Just take it. That's right. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just lift our hands and thank him. Father, we just thank you that these two are healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet by the power of the living God. In Jesus' name. Anybody else? Just want to miss out on anybody? Maybe you've never had hands laid on you before. Your shoulder? All right. Don't be afraid. The power of God is not something to be afraid of. In the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I command that tear and that rotator cuff to be repaired now by the power of the living God. There it is coming back together in Jesus' name. Now move your shoulder. Do something you couldn't do. This will be the test. Nice. Nice. <laughs> You're a true Roman. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Don't want to miss anybody. All right. Glory to God. Say it out loud. God is good, God is good. All, the time. all the time. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and receive our offering this morning. Praise God. This is our opportunity to bring our tithes and to give our offerings. Why do we bring our tithe? God already owns it. I mean, he actually owns all we have. We are simply stewards or managers of what we have. But he said, the tenth belongs to me. That's why you can't give it because it already belongs to him. You know, just like um, somebody had left a water bottle in my possession. So I brought it to Aaliyah because she knows the people that I, she can get it back to them. I didn't, I'm not going to give it to them. Why? Because it doesn't belong to me. It already belongs to him. So I'm bringing it to her to give to him because it already belongs to him. We bring our tithes because it already belongs to God. A tenth belongs to God. Offerings above and beyond that as God directs. And that is between us and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for being so good to us. We thank you that you want to bless us to make us a blessing. And so we thank you, Lord. We bring our tithes by the grace of God, we give offerings as you direct us, and we ask you to direct us now in Jesus' name. And everybody agree to that said? Amen. Amen. If you're making out a check this morning, you can make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, you want a tax deductible receipt, raise your hand while the ushers give you an envelope. Just keep your hand up until they get to you. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Just want to remind you of a couple things. You can still, if you have not, sign up for our Marriage Matters Marriage Seminar that's coming up. Uh, we've made some room, so if you have not had a chance to sign up, it's a nice opportunity. Pastor John and Marine are going to be teaching uh, Marriage Matters. Um, and uh, it's, I'm really looking forward to just getting a tune-up. There's things that we need to be reminded of. And we don't always hear that much about marriage. Amen? So we get a chance to uh, receive that tune-up. So that's coming up here not too long. Uh, what's that? Is that next weekend? Yeah. yeah, coming Friday. All right. And then don't forget about Wednesday nights. We've got uh, the last two of The Chosen on Wednesday nights, season two. Uh, we've been doing, and uh, that's just been blessing my socks off. And then we have discussion after we watch it, and uh, that's been very good as well. And then Saturday night prayer, we're praying for our country. And the, the Bible commands us to pray, you know, if we don't like what's going on in our country, we come and we pray and uh, release God's ability into the earth. All right? Glory to God. My wife has more announcements, but let's all stand. Let's present our tithes and offerings to him, to our Heavenly Father, to the Lord Jesus. Say it out. Let's say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father Lord, Jesus, Lord Jesus, I bring my tithes. I, bring my tithes, I, give, my offerings, I give my offerings according to your word, to your word because, I want to obey the covenant. because I want to obey the covenant. And you said, put me to the test. You said, put me to the test. If I'll not open you, the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing. 
You don't have room enough to receive. I got more room, Lord. So I'm putting you to the test. I thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the blessing. Overflowing. Overflowing. More than enough. More than enough. The blessings of God. The blessings of coming God. Upon me coming upon and me. And chasing me down. And chasing me down. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.